Well, good morning. morning. Give me just a second here. All right, how, how is everyone doing this morning? Good deal. I'm great. It, it's amazing that I get to, I get this opportunity. It's an honor that I get this opportunity to bring the word of God to y'all this morning. Amen. Amen. If you've been joining us, um, we've been in our series at COD, and many of you know that, that Pastor Mike has been teaching us on the Sabbath the past three weeks or so. Um, and I just want to do a little recap here on, on what we've been learning. You know, we've learned an amazing, a, a bunch of amazing things about the Sabbath, and I know it's, it's hard for you to take it all in at once, and these are all things that we need to study for ourselves. and um, so I just want to recap here. We have learned that the Sabbath has been misunderstood for centuries, right? It has been taught that we are to gather on Sundays rather than Saturdays. Some have taught that we can even make it whatever day we want to make it. We have learned that as followers and believers, we still have an obligation to keep the law and obey the Sabbath. You see, once we come to that, that knowledge of God's commands, it's no longer an option. The Sabbath is to be set apart. It should be different than any other day of the week. And then this last week, we learned that what the New Testament says about the Sabbath and how we can honor it. So we honor it by assembling together. It's a holy convocation. We rest. We cease from work or striving. And we let others rest. Amen? Amen. If you don't know by now, Epic Life Church is going to a Sabbath service. <laughs> Amen. And if you're still asking the question why, then I want to encourage you to go to our YouTube page and re-watch the, the last three messages. Um, to put it as simple as possible, we're making this transition to a Sabbath service because we're commanded to. And we want to honor the Father in everything that we do at Epic Life Church. As we know, the word akkad, it means to move as one. So as we make this transition, I want you all to know, and even you online, I want you to know that y'all are a huge part of this. We cannot do this without y'all. As we, as we assemble together on Sabbath, there are some things that we need to understand. And, and that's in order for our community to stay a cod, to be one, in order for us to keep this day different from any other day. And it starts with us, right? It starts in our own hearts. You see, when we invite other people into this community, when we bring a friend, whether it be a family member, a friend, or, or just a random, a random person, a stranger, there should be no doubt as to what they're going to experience when they step through these doors. They should be able to step foot in here and experience the love of Yeshua. And so I hope that when a first-time guest steps, steps in here and they leave, that they leave having felt the love of our Father. And that there is no doubt that God is with this community. For this experience to happen, it's dependent on me and you. It starts with us loving one another, right? It starts at our own egg, that time of fellowship and love. Our actions, our behaviors, and our love for one another can bring life and it can bring death. See, we obey God when we show love to one another. We'll see what Yeshua says in Matthew 22. Verse 36, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the Torah? And he said to them, you shall love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. We just read this in the Shema, right? This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. The entire Torah and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You see, what do we, we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago that actually was in our Galatians series, that all of the commandments in the Bible can be summed up to these two, 
If we follow these two commandments, then we follow all of them, right? The love that each one of us show to one another, it reveals how we feel about Adonai. We are called to walk in light, and we should be vigilant in our walk with the Lord. Now, I want to ask you a serious question. When someone engages you in a conversation, are you breathing life into them, or are you breathing death into them? Do they walk away feeling the love of Yeshua through you? Do they walk away knowing without a doubt that you're in a relationship with him? That you spend time in his word and in his presence? You see, they should feel it through our actions and through our words. We learn from the Bible that there is life and death in the power of our tongues. You see, we can very easily change someone's whole perspective on what, who God is by the way we speak and the way we act. And think about how that would be for an unbeliever, right? An unbeliever comes to us and, you know, it strikes up a conversation with us and all we do is speak negativity. I don't think they would want to return, Right? Let's see what it says in Ephesians about it. Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. So lay aside lying, and each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. We are one, we're a God. Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, nor give the devil a foothold. The one who steals must steal no longer. Instead, he must work, doing something useful with his own hands, so he may, ha may have something to share with one who has need. Let no harmful word come out of your, your mouth. Do not speak evil, but only what is be beneficial for building others up according to the need, so that it gives grace to those who hear it. Do not grieve the Ruach HaKodesh of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and quarreling and slander, along with all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God and Messiah also forgave you. Amen? Amen. And let's see what it says in James. So speak and act as those who will be judged according to, to a Torah that gives freedom. You see, when we... When we live by Torah, when we live by his word, it gives us freedom. And we have that power to, to speak to others with respect and love and grace and mercy. Another thing is this. It's important we understand and remember this. The Sabbath is a holy convocation. It is set apart by the Father. This is a sacred gathering that is like no other day. We have been called out by God himself to assemble together. We are coming together to have an experience with the Lord. And that is the feeling that others should have as they come into. You see, there should be a reverence for the, for the Father in this place. We should want to honor him and respect him with everything we do. And that should s start as soon as we step in these doors, right? Really, it should start before then. <laughs> Let's look at the word reverence because I, I want to give you this definition so that, that we can kind of understand it a little better. Reverence. It's honor or respect felt or shown. Deference especially. Profound, adoring, awed respect. In other words, there should be awe for Adonai in this place. You see, I want to put it this way. When we come together on, on our Sabbath service, or any service, we aren't coming together around a fire pit with the boys telling fishing stories. 
We aren't coming together at the coffee shop with the ladies to talk about what book we read or what movies we watched. We have assembled together at his request and for one reason, and that's to worship him. You see, now I don't want y'all going and saying, Pastor Dustin, he's a stick in the mud, doesn't want to do anything. <laughs> don't worry, I hear it from my wife. She's like, you're an old man. <laughs> You see, there's, I believe that there's a time and a place for it, right? And so that's why we have Oneg. It's a time of joy. It's a time of fellowship. It's a time of happiness. And, you know, I want to say something about that, that it's amazing coming from where we've came from and just stepping back and seeing each one of y'all just show love to one another. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. It really makes you step back and just, I, I told Pastor Mike this, it makes you step back and say, look at what God is doing. Psalm 89, verse 7 and 8. For who in the skies can compare to Adonai? Who is like Adonai among the sons of gods? God is greatly feared or revered in the counsel of the holy ones and awesome above all around him. You see, what I'm trying to say here is there should be a healthy, a healthy fear for God in us. God blesses those that are in awe of him and that show reverence to, towards him. Psalm 128, a song of ascents. Happy is everyone in awe of Adonai who walks in his ways, for you will eat the labor of your hands. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. And all the men said amen. amen. <laughs> your children will be like olive saplings around the table. Behold, thus will be the man, the man will be blessed who fears Adonai. You see, when we show reverence to him, he blesses us. When we show obedience to him, he blesses us. And that's never going to change. He's the same today as he was yesterday and as he is the next. He expects us to live in righteousness. So how do we show reverence, fear, and awe to the Lord? It starts with that. It starts with living by righteousness. It begins with our willingness to die to ourself and obey his commandments. And I'm not talking about just when you walk into here. You see, because it's easy in here. We love each other in here, right? I'm talking about when you walk out these doors and you step, it, step foot into a world that's full of hatred, anger, deceit. Are we letting the light of Adonai shine through us? See, when you and I took that step of faith, we chose to put Messiah Yeshua first in our life. And we also chose to put away our old way of acting and thinking and living. It's just what Ronnie spoke about. We see it in Galatians. Galatians 2 verse 20. And it is no longer I who live, but Messiah lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by trusting Ben Elohim, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Amen? Amen. See, we are to speak and act according to the word of God. And not just the back of this book either, the front of that book. How we live our life is how we demonstrate reverence for the Lord. Our pursuit of this, our pursuit of this kind of holiness is because he is holy. Amen? Amen. First Peter 1. Instead, just like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in everything you do. For it is written, Kedoshim you shall be, for I am Kadash. You died to your old way of living, and now you're living holy because he is holy. We see it in Titus 1. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure but their mind and conscience are defiled. 
You see, so if we're, we're spending time in, in things that are not making us pure, how do you think that makes God feel, right? Because we're called to live a holy life, a righteous life, because he's holy. He loves us. He wants to bless us. He's not out to get us. You see, we, we hear it all the time, right? He's not trying to take things away from us. He's trying to get things to us, and we've got to step out of the way of that sometimes. We've got to get out of his way and let him do his work. Secondly is this. We show reverence for God by learning how to truly worship him. And I mean truly worship him. You see, from the moment that these shofars sound, all of our focus should be on God. And as we hear it, we need to let it penetrate our souls. It should pull those emotions of repentance from you. It should change and stir the Ruach HaKadosh that is within you. The Holy Spirit that is within you should start to stir as soon as those, those ram's horns blow. And you see, we do this so that one day when the shofar is blown and the Messiah rides in, that the shofar blast that you hear is one of celebration and not one of sorrow. Numbers 10.10. Also, at your days of rejoicing, feast and new moons, you are to blow on the trumpets or the shofars over your burnt offerings and your fellowship offerings. They will then be a reminder for you before Adonai your God that I am Adonai your God. You see, this should take the focus off of us and put it on him. It should be a wake-up call. And it's a reminder of just how great and powerful God is. It, it's to remind us of the warnings of the prophets who raise their voices like the shofar to touch our consciences. To remind us of the alarms of battle that accompanied the destruction of the temple. To cause us to be in awe of God. Well, we, see, we see Amos ask the question, when the ram horns are sounded in a town, do the people not tremble? That should be our very mindset as soon as we walk in those doors and we hear that shofar. It should draw those, those emotions of repentance out of us. It should help us to search our own heart right then and there and say, what have I been doing that is unpleasing to you? Shine a light on it. Shine a light in my heart. Show me what I've been doing that's not pleasing to you so that I may repent. It should remind us of a great day of judgment that is coming. And just like I said before, it's a day of celebration for us. And it's a day where I pray that each one of you will hear the words, well, well done, good and faithful servant, and not the words of depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You see, I said this earlier, but I want to say it again. We have been called by him to worship. No one else. We've been called by him together in worship. You see, when the worship band begins to play, we want people worshiping here. We want to see people giving him praise and him glory. Our full attention should be on him and nothing else. You see, one of the best ways for us to keep our Sabbath service holy is devote ourselves to worshiping. Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. You see what's out there? It's shaken, right? We don't need to be showing gratitude to that. We need to be showing gratitude to a kingdom that cannot be shaken, a kingdom that's everlasting. Through this, we may offer worship in a manner pleasing to God with reverence and awe. There it is again, with fear for the Lord, with awe for the Lord, with our whole heart and nothing less. 
See, worship's supposed to be something different. And though it's all, although it's often grouped with praise, it goes well beyond that. It happens when we apply great worth to something or someone. We don't just worship God for the things that he has done for us, but we worship him for who he is. It is a spiritual act that happens when our spirit connects with his. You see, Jesus told us in John 4 that, that God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. True worship is not about the songs we're singing. It's about our spirits connecting with his. And when we come to the understanding of, of who God is, and we see his greatness above everything else in our life, Above everything else that's going on there, out there, we see his greatness. And we recognize the beauty of his holiness. That is when worship occurs. It's when you say, I'm going to set everything else aside right now. I'm going to humble my heart. I'm going to repent. And I'm going to focus on him. He's at the forefront of our minds. I hope by now that you understand that worship, worship is a major part of who we are as born-again believers. It is one of the ways that we enter into fellowship and communion with Adam and I. You see, understanding this may lead you to the question of, what does the Bible say about how we're supposed to worship? And I'm honestly glad that you're probably thinking that right now because the Bible, it's It's amazing. It gives us so many examples of what worship is supposed to look like. The entire Bible is what it's supposed to look like. Psalm 134. A song of ascents. Behold, bless Adonai, all servants of Adonai, who stand by night in the house of Adonai. Lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless Adonai. May Adonai bless you out of Zion, maker of heaven and earth. You see, this is a powerful display of what worship is supposed to look like. And I want you to hear me out on this because I, I want to say this. I say this out of love. Standing there with your hands in your pockets or your arms crossed is not what worship is supposed to look like. And I'll be transparent with you. I was that guy. I would stand there and I'd be worried about what others were thinking. I'd be scared to, to show love to Adonai. And can I tell you, once I realized how powerful he is and how worthy he is of it, it changed everything. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters at that time, right? Whatever is going on around you, whatever happened at the house this morning, whatever happened on your way here, nothing else matters at that time but to show love to our Father. And we see that we do that by lifting our hands, raising our hands. Don't, don't let the enemy take that from you. Because he wants to. He doesn't want to see us loving on our God. He wants us distracted. Psalm 63, 2 through 5. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I look for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Since your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. You see, when we walk through the doors in the morning, this is what we should be looking for. Because we want to experience his power and his glory. It should be the thing that we're seeking as we gather together. Since your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I lift up my hands. You see that we just see right there that we're worshiping with our lips, with our hands raised, right? not with, their, with them in our pocket. See, this is an expression of how we really feel about the Lord. And once you come to the understanding of, of what he is and who he is and, and the love that he shows us, then you don't get afraid to do that. 
You see, it's that time of connection with him. It's that time that we get to submit everything to him. That time that we get to reflect and thank him for everything that he's doing in our lives. See, this is what the holy and the righteous do. It's a reflection of our heart. Now, I want to take you to a, uh, a story this morning in Nehemiah. Uh, because it's stories like these that, that help us create and shape what our communities should look like. It's an example for what our service should be. This is what we should be experiencing and acting like. This is being a cod. So if y'all will, flip with me to uh, Nehemiah verse eight, or chapter 8, verse 1. Then all the people were brought as a single body into the plaza that was before the water gate. They said to Ezra the scribe, Bring out the Torah scrolls of Moses that Adonai had commanded Israel. Ezra the Kohen brought the Torah before the assembly, which included men and women and all who could understand what they heard. This happened on the first day of the seventh month. Look at what we see here. The entire body, the entire assembly, all that could understand were asking Ezra to bring out the Torah. They wanted the truth. They wanted to hear the word of God. They're coming together as one to have an experience with the Father. And what do we see here to top it all off? We see this is happening on Shabbat. The first day of the seventh month. This is Yom Terah. It's Rosh Hashanah. A day of shouting. And it's happening on the Sabbath. Verse 8. Uh, chapter 8 verse 3. So he read, read from it before the plaza in front of the water gate from first light until midday in the presence of the men and women and others who could understand and all the people listened attentively to the scroll of the Torah. See, all of their focus was on, on, on the Torah, on his word. Verses 5 through 6. Ezra opened the scroll in the sight of all people for he was above all the people. When he opened it, all the people stood up Ezra blessed Adonai, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, as they lifted up their hands. Then they bowed down and worshipped Adonai with their faces to the ground. This right here, that is total ref, uh, reverence and pure worship right there. You see, this church and this community should be a reflection of the scripture that we just read. A story like this should teach us of who we are to be. And the point is this, Shabbat is holy, and we should come prepared. We should come prepared with a humble heart, prepared to sing and worship, and prepared to lift our hands in love for Adonai. And for some of us, we just got to show up on time. <laughs> <laughs> you see, lifting our hands is just one of the many ways that we can express our love to him. But there are many more expressions of worship that we see throughout the Bible. And I want to encourage each one of you to find that, that form of worship that helps you connect best to the Father. Another expression that we see is kneeling or bowing down. One of the first instances we see of this is in Genesis 18, when the three heavenly visitors came to Abraham. He knew that they represented a God, so he bowed down to the ground before them. Genesis 18. When he lifted up his eyes to see, suddenly three men were standing right by him. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed down to the ground. Then he said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your eyes, please do not pass by your servant. You see, bowing and kneeling have been associated with wor worship and reverence for a very long time. Any of y'all want to take a guess at what, uh, what the Hebrew uh, meaning is for uh, worship? What the word worship means in Hebrew? <laughs> Besides Pastor Mike? 
it means to bow down. You see, I think about it like this, and it's when we bow down, it's showing true surrender. When we kneel at his feet, it's true surrender. It's saying that your will and your plan and your purpose is greater than than what I got going on, and I'm going to surrender it to you. And I'm going to pray that that you're going to do with it what you will. See, the Bible has also taught us that singing and dancing are a form of worship. Just look at the story of King David in 2 Samuel. You see, the Ark of the Covenant had been built as a symbol of God's presence, presence and glory but it had been lost and forgotten for 70 years. David was seeking to bring the ark to the city of Jerusalem so that all of Israel could worship the Lord in one place. You see, he struggled with this for months and months. It went on and things just kept happening, kept keeping him from doing it. And it was one thing after another for him. But when the day came and it finally happened, he danced with pure joy. Nothing would stop him. Not the people who thought he looked silly, or even the, his self-consciousness, right? He didn't have fear of what the people around him were thinking. And, and you see, this is amazing. You see, we get this opportunity to worship like this every service, every Shabbat, without reservation, without limits, and without care in the world, except to show love to the one who truly matters the most and who deserves everything that we have to give him. Second Samuel six, fourteen through fifteen. Meanwhile, David was dancing before Adonai with all his might, while he was wearing a linen of ephod. So David and the entire house of Israel brought brought up the ark of Adonai with shouting and with the sound of the shofar. There we see it again with the sound of the shofar. Now I want you to remember something. At this time, David was the king of all of Israel. You see, some people probably thought that his behavior, the, the way he was acting, that it wasn't suited for a king. But he did not care. He loved the Father that much. This was worship without limits. It was something that he was offering up to the Lord from the bottom of his heart. It was an overflow of love and gratefulness for the goodness of God. Colossians 3.16 let the word of Messiah dwell in you richly, teaching and, uh, and admonishing one another with all wisdom in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with gratitude in your hearts to God. You see, we see worship as an action word, and it's something that's done with an expression, an emotion that comes from within us and is poured out to God. It is not something that you keep bottled up inside of you. We have to understand that worship isn't about us, but it's about him. And we shouldn't let things like pride, fear, or embarrassment keep us from doing it. It should be something that bursts out from our hearts, showing your love and admi admiration for our awesome God. The most important thing that we should remember is this. No matter what expression of worship you choose, we must do it in spirit and in truth. And that means that it comes from our heart with all sincerity. See, because when we do this, when it rises up within us, when it rises up within our spirit, it comes straight out of our mouths and our actions, and it goes straight to his ears and his eyes. It is designed to be an outward and vocal expression. Many of these expressions of worship that we look at just involve music. But we see in Scripture that not all of them do, and I want to point out a few for you. See, the first one is this. Sacrifice and surrender. Bowing down at his feet. Surrendering. Arms lifted. It's a true sacrifice. I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, when we're living in sin, we're not sacrificing our bodies to God. You see, the things that we do, the things that we read, the things that we listen to, it all affects it. It's the easiest way for the enemy to get into our minds. When we offer ourselves to God as a vessel to be used to bring glory and honor to his kingdom, it is an act of worship. Yeshua was the greatest example of what sacrifice and surrender is all about. The second one is this. Working. Colossians 3.17 And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Yeshua, giving thanks to God the Father through him. See, everything that we, we do, God can be glorified through it. Remember, God has you in your vocation. He has you at your job. He has you in whatever area of ministry that you serve in for a reason. You see, we've got to put the priority on honoring him in every area, every aspect of our life. Our jobs, our homes. The third one is this, giving and generosity. See, giving has always been a form of worship in the Bible. We have been commanded to honor and glorify God in this way. The entire Torah is filled with requirements to bring the, first, the firstborn of your flock and the first fruits of your harvest. We see that in De Deuteronomy, that every time the nation of Israel, they came together, they brought something before Adonai. I want to point out that, that this wasn't just in the form of a sacrifice. You see, we see in the Bible that it was, also, it was called a free will offering. Let's read Deuteronomy 16. Then you will keep the feast of Shavuot to Adonai your God with a measure of, free will, of a free will offering from your hand. It's also known as a praise offering, uh, which you are to give according to how Adonai your God blesses you. So you will rejoice before Adonai your God in the place of Adonai your God chooses to make. His name will dwell, his name will dwell. You, your son and daughter, slave and maid, Levite and outsider, orphan and widow in your, mind, in your midst. You will, you will remember that you were a slave in Egypt and you are to take care and do these, these statutes. You see, Moses here is speaking specifically about the three harvest, harvest festivals. Any, any of y'all want to take a shot at what those were? Besides Pastor Mike, because it was Passover, it was Feast of Shavuot, and it was Feast of Sukkot. And we see that it was appropriate to give the sacrifice during during normal feast days. But the free will offering, it could be given any time. See, unlike other offerings that were governed by more strict rules, uh, the priest could eat, eat the free will offering on the day of a sacrifice or the day after. These type of offerings did not always have to be animal or grain or drink offering. And the first, first time we see it mentioned in the Bible is in Exodus 35. Let every wise-hearted man among you come and make everything that Adonai has commanded, including the tabernacle, its tent and its covering, its clasp and its boards, its crossbars, its pillars and its bases. See, God had given specific instructions on how to build the tabernacle, and then Moses relayed this message uh, of what the supplies they were, they were in need of. Then the people responded as their hearts stirred in them. You see, I want to point that out because these people there, it was, he only wanted it brought forth if their heart was right. If their heart, if that was what was true in their heart, that's what he wanted. Exodus 35, 20 through 21. Then all the congreg congregation of Benai Israel departed from before Moses. Everyone whose heart stirred him, there we see it again, and everyone whose spirit was willing came and brought Adonai's offering for the work of the ten, tent of meeting, and for all its service, as well as for the holy garments. I love what we see here, because it instantly takes us to the condition of the heart. 
when you think about it, the free will offering is huge for us today because we rely on the sacrifice of Yeshua and not the sacrifice of animals for our atonement. All the time, the money, and the resources we have to give are given freely as the Holy Spirit leads us to. And you see, I, I want to put it this way. How, how many of you grew up with siblings? Right? And you were told to share things. I know for my boys it's hard. <laughs> and so sometimes you had to share things that you really didn't want to. Right? How many times are we doing that to God? How many times are we offering something to him, but we're really not wanting to give it over to him? We're really not wanting to surrender it to him. We're just giving it to him because, you know, we're being told to, right? And God says, it's your heart that I want. I don't care about the gift that you're giving, but it's your heart that I want you to give. You see, the trick for many of us is noticing and obeying when the Spirit leads. God has given us everything that we have and everything that we need. If he moves our heart, then we should be giving cheerfully. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Let each one, one give as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You see, giving is a sign of obedience, but it's also a sign of gratitude and joy. When we give in this way, it isn't because God needs anything, but it's because we want to show our love for him. God expects us to be good stewards of all things that he has given us and to show our love for him by offering our very best to him. See, I want to look at Genesis 4 here to help us understand that, that it doesn't always matter what we offer, but how we offer it. Genesis 4, 3 through 5. So it happened after some time that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to Adonai. While Abel, he also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. Now Adonai looked favorably upon Abel and his offering. But upon Cain, his offering, he did not look favorably. Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. The offerings that we see here from Cain and Abel... These were the first recorded offerings to God. You see, this is powerful, and it's important for us to notice this. These offerings happened before the law had been given. I want to raise the question here. Why was God pleased with Abel's offering, but not the one from Cain? Some Bible scholars suggest it's because Abel's offering was a blood offering, and others suggest it's because Cain's offering was not a first fruits offering. I want to I quote something here. It's from Claude Maritoni, an Old Testament professor at Northern Baptist Seminary. He contends that the reason is likely due to Cain's attitude towards giving, as evidenced by the conversation that Cain has with God in verses 6 through 7. And we'll take a look at that. Genesis 4, 6 through 7. Then Adonai said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, it will lift. But if you do not do well... Sin is crouching at the doorway. It desire is for you, but you must master it. You see, Hebrews 11.4 seems to reinforce that Cain's attitude was a major issue. You see, by faith, by faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain. Through faith, he was commended as righteous when God approved of his gifts. And through faith, he still speaks, although he is dead. You see, I think it was the condition of the heart there. Abel willingly gave the firstborn. See, when we, we put our faith in God and give from our heart without holding back, he sees it, and it brings honor and glory to his name. He's less interested in the amount we give or the thing that we give, and he's more focused on the attitude in which we give it. You see, I want to leave you with this. 
Every day there are people that are willing to stand in lines for our favorite concert, our favorite sporting event, our favorite artist. And it's obvious that as consumers of that, that we're willing to give our very best without hesitation. We're willing to go above and beyond to consume these things and to show our attention to these things. But these events, these products, they're good, but they're nothing compared to God and, and who he created us. He saved us and he loves us. See, so let's take the focus off of ourselves and off of worldly things and let's put the focus back on him. Amen. Amen. So I just want to say this, that we have a father that loves you. And he expects the very best from you. So as we begin to worship right now, I want you to truly submit everything over to him. Just forget about everything else that's going on around you. Think about this one moment with him this connection between you and him. And just feel it in your hearts. Search your own heart. Remove anything from it that is unpleasing to him because he wants to bless you. He will bless you. So as we, we begin to worship, I'm going to have Pastor Mike come up and I'll be up front as well. And if you need prayer, Please do not be afraid. Do not be embarrassed. Step up. Let us pray for you. We're called to pray for one another. And so no matter what you have going on in your life, this is a time that you can turn it over to him. We serve a mighty and loving father. So let's worship.